In the early morning hours, two young women, Sandra Smith and her cousin Nicole Childress, noticed a distressed teen on the corner of 25th and State, babbling in a foreign language. The youth was 14-year-old Konarak Synthesomphone. The damage was so severe, the kid could only speak Lao, his mother tongue. It was obvious the boy needed help. The two women called 911. What is your emergency? Returning home with a fresh pack of beer, a tall blonde man noticed the boy and the two women. He walked up to them and proceeded to explain that Conorak was his 19-year-old lover and how he liked to drink himself silly on weekends and shock people, acting like this. It was all fine, the blonde said, wrapping his arm around Conorak and attempting to lead him away. He was about halfway to his place at the Oxford Apartments when the police arrived. Officers John Balkerzak and Joseph Gabrish listened to the blonde story, stifling giggles. When Sandra and Nicole pointed out the blood on Conorak's body, the officers told them to b off. At his place, the blonde showed the policeman Conorak's neatly folded clothes and the two photos he'd taken of the boy. The whole time, the smooth-talking man was showering the officers with praise going on about how diligently they worked in such a crime-ridden neighborhood. The policemen were so at ease that when one of them peeked inside the man's bedroom, he didn't even notice a corpse on the floor. Here is what the officers reported to the dispatcher. The intoxicated Asian naked male <laughs> was returned to his sober boyfriend. And uh, we're going to be a minute. My partner's going to get de-loused at the station. <laughs> Glenda Cleveland, whose daughter and niece called 911, was disturbed by the story and actually contacted the police to know if the boy was all right. Well, how old was this child? It wasn't a child, it was an adult. Are you sure? Yep. Are you positive? He's, uh, it's all taken care of, ma'am. Once the blonde was left alone, he killed Conorak and took the next day off work to dismember the bodies. If only the police had taken the situation more seriously, they'd not only become heroes, they could have saved four more lives. A simple background check would have revealed that the man was a convicted child molester, still under probation. This alone would warrant further investigation and put the killer behind bars. Two months later, Tracy Edwards led the police to the very same apartment, which finally resulted in the blonde's arrest. Milwaukee police found body parts in a north side apartment, and now they wonder if they've uncovered some kind of death factory and the blonde's name was Jeffrey Dahmer. A quiet mixer at the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory, Dahmer didn't shy away from his deeds. The interrogations lasted two weeks, and he readily confessed to killing 17 males. The case became a national sensation, in part because of the extreme brutality of the murders. Jeffrey Dahmer's former neighbors are enraged. Tonight, they're charging police with neglecting their... Dahmer had an established routine for the kills. He'd approach a male, ask if he'd be willing to pose for nude pictures, and offer a tempting $50 to $100 fee. Once in his apartment, Dahmer would serve his guest a drug-laced drink, wait for him to pass out, and proceed to perform acts on the body before or after strangling the person. Towards the end of his killing spree, Dahmer got an idea of turning people into docile zombies. Conorak sent the Somphone was the second victim he'd subjected to the experiment. He didn't want people. He needed inert living dolls. Uh, when you uh, depersonalize another person and view them as just an object, uh, an object for pleasure instead of a, a living, breathing human being. Arguably, even more disturbing than the crimes was how the killer was allowed to roam free. Sadly, the incident with Conorak sent the Somphone wasn't exceptional. The case is brimming with homophobia, racism, and police negligence. The first time Dahmer was stopped by the police, he was just 18, fresh out of high school, but already a murderer. He claimed his first victim on June 18, 1978. Steve Hicks, 18 himself, was hitchhiking to a rock concert. By that time, Dahmer had already been obsessed with murderous fantasies. I had had uh, fantasies about picking up a, a hitchhiker and uh, taking him back to the house and uh, 
having complete control and dominance. Dahmer picked Hicks up and, with his parent away, drove the team to his place for them to hang out. It was growing late, so Hicks wanted to leave, and Dahmer didn't want him to. He strangled the teen and dismembered his body. Later, he bagged it and, using nighttime to disguise his actions, drove the bundles to dispose of the remains elsewhere. When the police pulled him over, Dahmer told the officers how his parents had just divorced, how depressed he was staying in a big house on his own, and that now, he was simply taking the trash out to the city dump. It was all true, save for the actual reason of the late night cruising. The officers readily believed the polite teen and let him go. Another close call came in 1988, when Dahmer was arrested for molesting a 13-year-old Laotian kid, Samsak sent the Samphone. Coincidentally, and shockingly so, the boy was an older brother of Conorak. As usual, Dahmer lured the youth into his apartment for a photo shoot. He drugged the boy and attempted to fondle him, but Samsak went straight out the door. When Samsak got home, he collapsed and was rushed to the hospital. The truth came to light, and Dahmer was arrested right in the factory he worked at. It was quickly revealed that this man had had multiple brushes with the law before. 1981, arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct. 1982, arrested for indecent exposure, having flashed roughly 25 people at Wisconsin State Fair Park. Awaiting trial for the molestation, Dahmer continued his murder spree right under the noses of the police and his grandma, with whom he was living at the time. Eventually, he was sentenced to one year in prison with work release and five years of probation. Jeffrey's father, Lionel, felt that his son had serious mental problems and even wrote a letter to Judge William Gardner. I have reservations regarding Jeff's chances when he hits the streets. I have experienced an extremely frustrating time trying to urge initiation of some type of treatment. I sincerely hope that you might intervene, intervene in some way to help my son, who I love very much and for whom I want a better life. I do feel, though, that this may be our last chance to initiate something lasting and that you can hold the key. It was all in vain. Dahmer walked free and the killings renewed, growing increasingly vicious and perverted. Dahmer's choice of victims was baffling to profilers, as serial killers usually target people of the same race, but Dahmer didn't seem to care. My only objective was to find the, the best looking uh, guy that I could. Their sexual preference didn't matter to me, their race didn't matter to me. Looking for an attractive partner is a natural thing, so why the murder, one might ask. A look at Dahmer's life might provide quite a few clues. His mother, Joyce, had serious mental problems. During her pregnancy, she was downing as many as 27 pills daily, with some of the meds potentially harmful to the fetus. When Jeffrey was born, she seldom touched the child and forbade others to do so. The boy was growing up healthy and lively until a double hernia surgery shortly before his fourth birthday. The experience traumatized little Jeffrey. He repeatedly asked his father if his private parts had been excised, and the boy became more silent and introverted. At the age of four, Jeffrey saw his father remove animal bones from beneath their home. First, he crawled down there himself to find more bones, but then he started hunting for roadkill. Jeffrey would go on to grow an extensive collection of bones, sometimes preserving dead animals or soaking them in acid to obtain their complete skeletons. Both Lionel and Joyce spent preciously little time with their son. Instead, they constantly argued. The fights were so heated that young Jeff escaped the house and hid in the woods behind it, waiting for the storm to blow over. Being silent and withdrawn at home, Jeffrey blossomed into a class clown to compensate. Despite this, he remained a loner with virtually no friends. By 14, Jeff was drinking heavily, going as far as to guzzle alcohol during classes, calling it his medicine. At about the same time, disturbing morbid fantasies began popping up in Jeff's head. Started have, having obsessive uh, thoughts of, of violence intermingled with sex, and it just got worse and worse. Uh, I didn't know how to tell anyone about it, so I didn't. I just kept it all inside. 
I, I don't know where, where it came from. Dahmer's ex-boyfriend Nick, whom he briefly dated in 1985, claimed that Dahmer opened up to him about having been molested by his father, Lionel, until he was 16. With no solid proof, it's up in the air. By the time Jeffrey reached graduation, his parents had filed for divorce. Lionel Dahmer moved out and lived in a hotel. And at one point, his mother Joyce grabbed Jeff's younger brother, David, and left to stay with her relatives. Jeff spent the next six weeks alone, drinking heavily and lamenting his loneliness. As his sense of abandonment grew, so did his dark fantasy world, and hitchhiker Stephen Hicks happened to be right there at the wrong time and place. Jeff enrolled at Ohio State University, but dropped out after the first term because of his persistent alcohol abuse. Lionel persuaded Jeff to join the army. Some discipline would do him good, he thought. When in the army, Dahmer continued drinking and assaulted two fellow soldiers, Preston Davis and Billy J. Capshaw. In 1981, Dahmer was discharged from the army for alcohol abuse. Lionel was growing seriously alarmed with his son's alcoholism, lack of direction in life, and increasingly apparent homosexuality. Jeff's grandma was deeply religious, and the only family member to whom Jeff showed any affection. So Lionel Dahmer sent his son to live with her in West Allis, Wisconsin. Jeff used to accompany her to church, but it didn't help. Dahmer continued to struggle with his sexuality, and coupled with the great social stigma, it only added to his feeling of inadequacy weirdness, and otherness. Never understood it. There was no use trying to fight it because I, I couldn't rid myself of it. It was, it was too powerful and persistent. Do you dislike it? Yes, it's caused uh, a lot of problems. After years of unemployment, in 1985, Dahmer was hired as a mixer at the Milwaukee Ambrosia Chocolate Factory. He had to work night shifts six days a week. Around the same time, Dahmer discovered the underground Milwaukee gay scene. In 1987, Dahmer killed his second victim, Stephen Tuomi. After the second time, it, it seemed like the compulsion to do it was too strong, and I, I didn't even try to stop it after that. From this point on, the murders didn't stop until the killer's capture. Dahmer got 16 life sentences, but didn't live through even one. On the evening of November 28, 1994, Dahmer and two other inmates, Jesse Anderson and Christopher Scarver, were assigned to clean the showers of the prison gym. Scarver despised the two men. Anderson was doing time for the murder of his wife, having first blamed two black men for the attack. To Scarver, Dahmer looked like a glaring racist as well. After all, he'd killed so many African Americans. On top of that, he was appalled by the cannibal's lust for human flesh and his overall behavior. In prison, the class clown made a return. Dahmer often pranked both prisoners and guards. He crafted human limbs out of food, splattered them with ketchup, and left them in the open to be discovered by a hapless inmate or a corrections officer. Reveling in his infamy, Dahmer once noticed a young, nervous prison guard eyeing him. So he turned to the man, snapping, I bite. The guard jumped. Dahmer chuckled. So when Scarver noticed that he, Dahmer, and Anderson were left unsupervised, he confronted the cannibal with a previously concealed barbell rod. Dahmer dashed to the door, but Scarver blocked him and proceeded to beat him with the five-pound rod. Anderson suffered the same fate. Both men died as a result of the attack. Scarver believes the guards left them unattended on purpose. Just like with Robert Burdella, the Kansas City butcher, they'd simply had enough of the creep and his cocky attitude. Finally, the smooth-talking killer's arrogance sealed his own doom. Jeffrey Dahmer's formative years were a nightmare, but few people who went through similar ordeals actually became serial killers. It was his choice. Will horrid stories like this ultimately help human society rise above its criminal indifference, overcome racism, sexism, homophobia? It remains to be seen. Stay safe. <laughs>